Okay, now that we've learned the body directions and the planes, uh, let's start learning the names of specific structures within the brain. We're going to be using the sheep brain as our model, but it's very similar to the human brain. It's smaller than the human brain, and the folding of the cortex, the crinkly part on the outside, is different. But underneath the cortex, uh, the structures that you're going to find there are remarkably similar to the human brain. In fact, those structures are remarkably well conserved across mammalian brains in general. So let's start with the dorsal view. This is looking at the brain from above. The cerebrum is sort of the large anteriormost part of the brain. It's covered by the cerebral cortex, which we've already talked about, a thin layer of gray matter that's all crinkled up, folded up, where it folds in. That's called a sulcus, where it folds out like this. That's called a gyrus. And the cerebrum is divided up into two cerebral hemispheres the left cerebral hemisphere and the right cerebral hemisphere, which is uh, shown in the blue box here. The two hemispheres are divided by the longitudinal fissure. A fissure is just a sulcus. When a sulcus is really large and pronounced, we often call it a fissure. But it's the same thing. It's just a, a fold, in this case a very deep fold, that separates the left hemisphere from the right hemisphere. And it's, it gets its name from the fact that it runs along the whole length of the cerebrum. Here we have the cruciate fissure. You can see it forms kind of a cross with the longitudinal fissure, which is where it gets its name. Cruce is the Latin word for cross. And everything anterior to the cruciate fissure here, highlighted in teal, is the frontal lobe. We divide up the cerebral hemispheres uh, and the cerebral cortex into four lobes. We divide them up kind of arbitrarily. The, the four lobes have nothing to do with their function or their, their structure necessarily. They're named after the four bones, the skull bones, that overlie those lobes. So here's the frontal lobe. It's easy to remember. It's all the way toward the front or anterior part of the brain. Here we've got the sylvian fissure doesn't look like much uh, in this view, but as we'll see later on the lateral view and also when we when you start cutting the brain up, it's very deep and very pronounced sulcus. And this is one of the few sulci that's uh, conserved across species. Pretty much every uh, mammal that has folds, that has convolutions in its brain, that has sulci, has this sulcus. So it's a, an evolutionarily or phylogenetically very old uh, sulcus. And of course, everything that you see in the brain is bilateral. So if you have some structure shown and named on the left, you're going to find the same structure in the same place on the right. It's not going to be perfectly identical. You can see this sylvian fissure here over on the right kind of bifurcates, it branches off into two, but it's in more or less the same place uh, on the two sides of the brain. The brain is organized with bilateral symmetry, we say. So that's the sylvian fissure, named after an early neuroanatomist by the name of uh, Sylvius. It's also sometimes called the lateral fissure or the lateral sulcus. Just medial and dorsal to that is the suprasylvian fissure. Supra means above, and this one is sort of, if you were to look at the brain from the side, the lateral view, you'd see this is sort of dorsal uh, or above the sylvian fissure, at least right here. But it runs pretty much, it runs a, a very long distance along the brain here, from anterior to posterior. It's a useful landmark in the sheep brain because it divides the parietal lobe, which is all the cortex medial to it, from the temporal lobe, which is all the cortex lateral to it. So once you can identify the suprasylvian fissure, the parietal lobe is all the cortex medial, temporal lobe is all the cortex lateral to it. Let me show you a trick for finding the suprasylvian fissure. You can see the longitudinal fissure here runs front to back, anterior to posterior. And then there are a series of smaller sulci that run more or less parallel to it. Here's one, here's one, oops, and here's another one. But, oh, there are no more. The suprasylvian is the lateralmost sulcus 
that runs roughly parallel to the longitudinal fissure. It's the one that's the most lateral, furthest toward the side, but still running more or less front to back, like the longitudinal fissure. I said there were four lobes, there's one more. All the way at the very posterior end of the brain is where you'll find the occipital lobe, right here. In the sheep, there isn't an obvious landmark to show you where the occipital lobe ends and the parietal and the temporal lobes begin. Instead, try and find where the left and right hemispheres kind of meet in the middle, right about here, and then draw an imaginary line directly lateral to that, directly uh, from left to right or right to left, off to the side from that point. We'll talk more about the functions of these various lobes and the parts within the lobes over the course of the semester. Just caudal or posterior to the cerebrum and the cerebral cortex is the cerebellum. The word cerebellum is a diminutive form, so the elum at the end is kind of like ita or ito in Spanish, right? Your, abuel, your abuelita is your little grandmother, casita is a little house. In Latin, the cerebellum would be the little cerebrum. And it, it really is, in some ways, like a miniature cerebrum. It's got a cortex, a thin layer of gray matter that covers it. It's got lots of folds, many, many more folds than the cerebral cortex, but it's still got folds. And it's got white matter underneath the cortex and then uh, subcortical nuclei, bundles of gray matter underneath that. We'll talk more about its function later as well. And then just caudal to that is the medulla. Just caudal to the medulla, but you can't see it here, you'll find the, uh, the spinal cord. The medulla, you can see, has kind of a V shape. The two sides, or two edges, on the left and right, are not really parallel to one another at all. It makes this kind of V shape. It gets broader as you go more anterior. The spinal cord isn't like that. The two sides of the spinal cord are more or less parallel. So that's how you can tell where the medulla ends and the spinal cord begins. This is showing you a dorsal view of a different animal's brain. This is the dorsal view of the human brain. And you can see it looks pretty similar. Uh, you've got a big cerebrum covered with a, a folded up cerebral cortex. It folds in and out and in and out. But you can see that we have a much bigger cerebral cortex much larger cerebrum generally, and many, many more folds. But nonetheless, some of the, the general organization is the same. We've got a longitudinal fissure running down the midline, separating the left and right cerebral hemispheres. And the folds are different than in the sheep. Um, as the cortex expanded over the course of evolution, uh, the pattern of folding necessarily also changed. As you got more surface area, you had to fold it up more and fold it up differently. Uh, so the pattern of folding is going to be different from one species to the next, depending on how closely related they are evolutionarily. But there are a few similarities. So for example, uh, this structure right here, labeled C-sol, is the central sulcus. The central sulcus. And it's uh, sort of analogous to the cruciate fissure in that it separates the frontal lobe. All of this is frontal lobe in the human. Massive frontal lobes. It separates the frontal lobes from the parietal lobes, which are right here. And then just posterior to the parietal lobes are the occipital lobes right here. Now you'll notice that there are some things that are missing that were present on the sheep brain from the dorsal view. And that's the cerebellum and the medulla. We have a cerebellum and medulla, but because we stood upright, the dorsal part of our brain, the cerebrum, kind of tilted anteriorly. It rotated forward 90 degrees. And so you can't see the cerebellum and the medulla from the dorsal view anymore. They're hidden underneath the occipital lobe and part of the temporal lobe, right underneath here. We'll see those in a later view. Okay, next up is the lateral or side view of the brain. And here it is. We're looking at the right side of the brain here. This is a right lateral view. 
There are a few things we've already seen. So first off, this, all this here, is the cerebrum. Specifically, this is the right cerebral hemisphere. Just caudal to that is another structure we've seen before, and that's the cerebellum, the little cerebrum. We've also seen the medulla. Here it is. So just ventral and a little bit caudal to the cerebellum is the medulla right here. Up here on the cerebrum is the suprasylvian fissure. If you remember, that's the one that separates the parietal lobe from the temporal lobe, parietal lobe medial to it, and as you can see, a little dorsal, temporal lobe lateral and ventral to it. We've also seen the sylvian fissure. And now that we're looking at it from the side, you can see that the sylvian fissure extends down pretty far ventrally. You could only see about this much from the dorsal view. So it continues down, and importantly, it makes this little posterior jog here. It goes backward a little bit before it intersects with this sulcus. Right in that little bend there is a special patch of cortex we're going to talk about in a minute. But first, let's remind ourselves this is the frontal lobe, and then there's one more lobe we've talked about, which is the occipital lobe way in the back here. Here we've got the olfactory bulb. This is, you can't really tell, but this is kind of a little flap. It attaches right about here, but it, it hangs off. This part of the brain is kind of a relay station. Inside your nose, you've got what's called the olfactory epithelium. It's your organ of smell. It's a sheet of uh, chemoreceptors, neurons that are sensitive to chemicals, chemicals in the air that you breathe. In a way, when you, when you smell something, you're kind of tasting the air with this sheet of neurons. And the olfactory bulb gets that information. So it's relayed from the olfactory epithelium in your, the back of your nose, up in your nasal passages. It's relayed by way of a series of little nerves up to the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb then relays the information back to this patch of cortex here, which we'll talk about in a moment. Right where the olfactory bulb meets the brain is the beginning of this large sulcus called the rhinal fissure. Rhinal means over relating to the nose, like rhinoplasty or rhinoceros. And everything ventral to the rhinal fissure here, this patch of cortex here, is often referred to as the piriform lobe or piriform cortex, and it's largely devoted to smell. It's pretty big in animals, so it's sometimes referred to as a lobe. In humans, it's generally not referred to as a lobe but it, it can be referred to as the piriform cortex. The word piriform uh, comes from the word pear. Pyrus is the Latin word for pear, so this is kind of the pear-shaped cortex. It's not particularly pear-shaped in the sheep, but that's the, the origin of the name. And again, it's mainly devoted to smell and memory for smell. Here we have a patch of cortex, a special patch of cortex, called the insula or insular cortex. You can't see the whole thing. Part of it is actually buried in the sylvian fissure here. So it continues in kind of into the sylvian fissure underneath this overlying patch of temporal lobe. We'll see that later when we do a horizontal section through the brain. Now, this has a different structure in the humans. We have the same structure. We have the same patch of cortex called the insula. But in humans, it's completely obscured on the lateral view. You can't see it from the side because it's completely covered up with the frontal lobe, which continued to grow and grow and grow over evolution, and completely covered up by the temporal lobe, which continued to grow and grow and grow. So just as part of the insula is buried inside the sylvian fissure in the sheep, in us, the entire insula is buried inside the sylvian fissure. It's completely obscured by the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. But it's in there, and we'll see it in, uh, in lab, and we'll see it in the future. Next up, down here, you've got the optic nerve. This is a bundle of axons, about a million or so axons in humans, that carries visual information from the retina at the back of the eye back to the brain. Over here, we've got the pons. Pons comes from the Latin word for bridge. Um, it's, a, uh, it's sort of a little bump that extends ventrally. That's the easiest way to, to describe it and to find it. 
It's a place in the brain where a lot of axons cross over from one side of the brain to the other. It's mainly white matter, mainly axons going from one place to another. Hanging off the pons is the trigeminal nerve. Now here you've just seen the stump of the trigeminal nerve. Same thing with the optic nerve. This is just the stump of it. The optic nerve would extend out several centimeters to the back of the eye, but it's been cut off here. Same thing with the trigeminal nerve. It would extend out and actually branch off into one, two, three big branches that carry movement signals to different parts of the face and jaw and also carry sensory information from different parts of the face and jaw, mainly touch information from different parts of the face and jaw back to the brain. The word trigeminal comes from the from three heads. It's the large three-headed nerve. And then finally here you've got the spinal cord, just caudal to medulla. And you can say, see that there's kind of a pronounced divot right about there where the medulla ends and the spinal cord begins. The spinal cord is not part of the brain. This is considered outside the brain. But the medulla is considered part of the brain. So this is the end of the brain and the beginning of the spinal cord. And here we've got the same view, the lateral view of the human brain. Looks different. Uh, the blood vessels are still intact here, so that part of it is different. But other than that, it's, it's pretty similar to the sheep brain. First off, you've got the cerebrum. This is the right cerebral hemisphere. You've got the cerebellum right here. Uh, it's a little hard to see it, but you've got the, the medulla and the spinal cord right down there. You've got some cranial nerves poking out. Here's the occipital lobe. Here's an important structure, an important landmark in the human brain, and it has an analog in the sheep brain. Can you guess what that is? It's a large, deep sulcus on the lateral surface of the brain. That's the sylvian fissure, also called the lateral fissure or the lateral sulcus. And we're going to look at a model in class where uh, you'll be able to see how deep this is. And if we were to pull down the temporal lobe here, that's what this is, the temporal lobe, and sort of pull up the frontal lobe right here and peek down into the sylvian fissure, you'd see more cortex. You'd see this big patch of cortex sort of down at the bottom of the sylvian fissure. That's the insula. You can see part of the insula on the lateral view of the sheep brain, but you can't on the human brain. It's buried deep down in the sylvian fissure. But it's there. It's more cortex, and it's actually continuous with the rest of cortex. Remember that cortex is just one big sheet of gray matter. Next up is this sulcus right here, this large fissure, or sulcus, which separates the frontal lobe, our massive frontal lobes compared to the sheep, from our parietal lobes right here. That's the central sulcus. It's sort of analogous to the sheep's um, cruciate fissure. But this is the central sulcus, dividing frontal lobe from parietal lobe. Here you can see a coronal section through the human brain. And again, you've got cortex, convoluted, folded up, folds in and out and in and out with white matter underneath. Here is the frontal lobe. And then here is the temporal lobe. So, if you think carefully about what separates the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe, you'll remember that that's the sylvian fissure, which we saw in the previous slide, right here. So the slice we're looking at would be right about there. So it's separating the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe, this sulcus right here on the lateral surface. And there it is, on the lateral surface of the brain. That's the sylvian fissure again. And now you can really see deep down at the bottom of the sylvian fissure is more cortex. It's continuous with the frontal lobe and it's continuous with the cortex of the temporal lobe. This is the insula right here. This patch of cortex right there and this patch of cortex right there is the insula. Okay, there's a few other terms we need to learn. This is good enough time to learn them. If you turn back to the first page of your sheep brain packet, you'll see these terms and some lines next to them where you can write down their definitions.
We've mentioned the word nerve a couple of times, but I haven't defined it yet. And it's a term you've certainly heard before. Let's go ahead and define it explicitly so you know exactly what it is. When we're talking about a nerve, we're talking about a bundle of axons in the peripheral nervous system. We've already defined the peripheral nervous system. That's everything that's nervous tissue outside the brain and spinal cord. So a nerve is a bundle of axons outside the brain and spinal cord. For example, in your arm, you've got the brachial nerve carrying uh, the movement information, muscle movement information out to the muscles of the hand and the arm. And you've got sensory information, touch, cold, pain, and so forth, being carried along those axons from the hand and the arm up to the brain. That's a nerve, a bundle of axons in the peripheral nervous system. You could think of a nerve as being kind of like a, a USB cable. Uh, if your brain is like the, the CPU, the main part of your computer, the nerves are kind of like USB cables that carry control information out to, uh, let's say, or an external hard drive or something like that. And they can also carry sensory information, uh, other information from other peripheral devices back into the brain. Then you've got a ganglion. This is the term for a bundle of somas or cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. So a ganglion is a sense, essentially a little chunk of gray matter outside the brain and spinal cord. We'll see some of these later. You've got several spinal ganglia all along both sides of your spinal cord, just outside the spinal cord and the vertebrae. We also have names for these same kind of structures inside the brain and spinal cord in the central nervous system, or the CNS. So inside the central nervous system, a bundle of axons is called a tract. Sometimes it's also called a fasciculus. So a tract is a bundle of axons in the central nervous system. So for example, this white matter here consists of a series of discrete tracts that you can trace out from one place to another. If you zoom in on this white matter here, you'll see individual axons. Zoom out a little bit and you'd see bundles of axons carrying information from one chunk of gray matter to another, from the somas of one chunk of gray matter over to the somas in another chunk of gray matter. And then finally, we've got a, a nucleus, which is a bundle of somas in the central nervous system. So this is essentially a little chunk of gray matter in the central nervous system. For example, this right here is a nucleus. This is a nucleus right here. This is called the caudate nucleus. Now don't be confused. Nucleus has two different definitions in the context of this class. We've already talked about the nucleus as the part of an individual cell, the part of a microscopic cell that contains the DNA. In the context of gross neuroanatomy though, what you can see with the naked eye, a nucleus is a chunk of gray matter. It's a bundle of somas and dendrites in the central nervous system.